Okay. Laura, are we okay? We're looking good. You always looking good. Uh, <laughs> that's not what I asked. <laughs> okay. Welcome back. Thanks again for being with us. Thanks for God's blessing. Now we're going to get to the positive answer of Laura's question. I'm trying to look at these things positively. And I'm going to work from, again, passages that you, passages that you know. But let's, let's take a good look at these. So, Proverbs 6, 20 to 24. And I've written them out for you here, but this is the summary. You have faithful instruction, which is based upon nourishing your children, not just directing or commanding them. You want this impressed on the child's heart. This becomes woven into their everyday life. This protects them from immorality. So that's the goal here of what you're... You see the difference between this and trying to correct behavior. You, know, you always want to have that end goal. And if you, and if you want a better end goal, realize that you, realizing right now that you are instructing your grandchildren. Okay, because these children are going to be instructing their children. So the way you're raising them is going to have a direct impact on their grandchildren, which is the goal of, say, Psalm 78 at the beginning. So, my son, obey your father's commands and do not neglect your mother's instruction. The obey, the command there, is a command to be on guard. I use Bruce Walkie's commentary on Hebrew, is, on, on Proverbs, it's regarded as the best that we have in, in our circles. The man is a true scholar. It's a two-volume set. And, uh, it's, it's pastoral. It's warm. It's accurate. And really gets to the heart of the matter. And so he, he says here that the commands are like to be on guard. Be aware. Be alert. This, this, is not, this is not designed primarily to make mom and dad's life more comfortable. Right? It's designed to protect them. Because when it comes down to, when they are presented with an issue of a, whether they're a middle schooler, or an eight or nine year old, or a teenager, or a young adult, remembering that I made mom and dad happy will not cut it. But if they can learn to trust God in this, then that, that becomes the dynamic. It's not that you want them to be mean to you or anything, but the goal is not to make your life better. Okay. Well, the goal is to serve God. Yeah. How much work does God have to do with me? Or you? A right? Lot. A lot. Yeah. Yes. Huge. All right? And, I, and I'm beyond ancient, and there's still a ton of work for God to do with me. Okay? So, yeah, I, I need that. But, I, but I'm wanting him to work on me, and that's so I can get better. Well, your children, they, they need to see that we're humble before God. They need to see that we are just as much in the process of learning as they are. We need to see that, you know, Matthew, when Jesus speaks in the Gospels of Matthew 12, when he says, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. So we don't have the right to be annoyed with our kids, even though they are annoying. Well, sinners. <laughs> right, they're, 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 they're little pains. All right? And again, you guys have heard me say this before, but I, I, I can never pass up the opportunity. Water from the rock, Numbers 20. You know, in Numbers 14, the spies come back from the promised land, and there was 12 of them. And the majority of them, 10 of them say what? Remember what they 10 said? The spot in Numbers 14, the ten, the Joshua sends out, I mean, Moses sends out 12 spies to spy out the land. They come back. Ten of them have one thing to say. Remember what the ten said? Like they're giants. They're giants. They were worried about the. They're basically saying, Moses, you're an idiot. These people, they're, they're literally nine feet tall. They're professional killing machines. And they're basically going, we're professional whiners. We don't know how to do anything. <laughs> And you want us to go fight against this? And people started whining and moaning and complaining. And Joshua and Caleb said, wait a minute. 
God's given us this a piece of cake. We can take them out. And their response is they want to kill Moses and Aaron and go back to Egypt. The place where they had just left, right? Moses, Egypt was a great place, yeah. right? Yeah. They, they were so happy to be delivered from it. But now, faced with having to trust God, we want to go back to Egypt. So God comes to Moses. Remember what he says to Moses? Move out of the way, son. I'm going to wipe them out. <laughs> I'm going to take all these idiots out, these whiners and complainers, and give them their just desserts, and I'll start over with you. Remember what Moses says? He talks to my friend and says, hmm? you're not going to do it. Why? For his name. For his reputation. He, he's, because if, if you do this, people will say you weren't able to bring these people out, and you will look bad. Don't do this to them. God still took out about 3,000 of them, but he spared them. And then they went on this you know, walkabout for 40 years. Yeah, short walk. You know? <laughs> and they died slowly during that time. All those people died during that time. But during that time, those 40 years, what had been happening to them? They were, been, they were having to rely on God to survive. Yeah, so, you know, there was a Walmart... Oh, yeah, no, it was bare. Uh, you know, oh, bare. So, so at night there was an RV park they could plug in? <laughs> no, uh, it was, was there any place for light? No. The stars at night. The, the cloud. Yeah, the cloud, yeah. There was this cloud over top of them. During the day, it shielded them. During the night, it gave them light. Mm -hmm. And then when it was time to go, the cloud started moving. Oh, okay, time to go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we don't need any big deal here. God is here and care for them. The first GPS. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are, 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 are their clothes are their clothes wearing out? No. First cereal. Are their shoes wearing out? No. Forty years. Yeah. They had food every morning for forty years, and occasionally they got. Yeah, I gotta eat this again. Can we get a little bit of change here? So God gives them, so we want some meat. So God gives them, you know, four feet thick of quail. They just die in front of it. Well, you want meat? I'll say, uh, okay, here's meat. All right? 40 years. And Moses has been dealing with this for 40 years. Numbers 20, they, they get to the rock, and once again, the people are thirsty. It's a desert, right? So you just don't go down to the stream and dip some water or, you know, have your water bottle, Okay? They come back with the same routine. We're going to die. 40 years, we're going to die. <laughs> oh, we're thirsty. Egypt is way better than this place. How can you do this to us? And God comes to Moses and he says, Moses, walk over there, speak to the rock, and bring water to the people. And every gasket and Moses' head blows. <laughs> he lost it. He lost it. Are you kidding me? 40 years? He walks over, takes his, takes his staff, smashes the rock. You rebels! Must we bring water from this rock for you? you know, now, were they rebels? Yes. Absolutely. Were they ungrateful? Yes. Do they have memories that you know, were, were longer than 30 seconds? No, they were <laughs> an ungrateful mess. Just like when you have taken care of your child for four days in a row and cleaned up after them and they were sick and you cleaned their mess and you took care of them and you, know, you changed the sheets four times in the last two hours and all the rest of that. Oh, mommy, it's dirty in here. <laughs> and I have been patient for three days. No more. And the wrath of mom descends upon this child. <laughs> and this kid is trying to find his way under the bed. He's trying to do whatever, he, you know. Moses loses it with them. And that's why he and Moses um, and Aaron could not go into the promised land. So I lose it every day. So how am I getting in the promised land? Because of Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. But... Why didn't he go into the promised land? Because, because he didn't he show did, God he in that action. Speak to the rock. Well, speak to he me. Didn't obey God. You're there. No, no, no. This is what she's saying is right. You're His right action. twice today. Thank you. 
His actions were not reflective of God to the people. So he did not represent God as holy. He made God look like him. Mm -hmm. He made God look like Moses. And when I lose it with my kids, I make God look like me. Mm -hmm. Ordinary. Mm -hmm. But God is not ordinary. He is kind and compassionate and gracious. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Jesus Christ, you know, he took on my sin. He had no sin, 2 Corinthians 5. He had no sin. He took on that sin. He who had no sin became sin for me and then received the punishment. It was not a representative symbolic death. He died for my particular sins. The ones I can remember, the ones I don't remember, all of them. He became actually guilty. And the wrath of God was poured out on him. And in that moment, not only on poured out for my sins, but for all of you here, all of you listening on Facebook, that any Christian that God has saved, that God has redeemed, so in the history of the planet, at that moment, all of those sins, the wrath of God, poured out on Christ. So when God looks at you now, he sees the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see your garbage. Mm -hmm. He's aware of it, but I understand he's just true. So when I lose it like that, I'm making God out to be like me and my mess. Doesn't mean that we are soft on sin, right? Like I've told you guys before, I think Ruth and I probably created global warming. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying to back off, but it's got to be in the context of that. And even doing that, occasionally you would have a child come to you and thank us for, for being disciplined because they knew it's what they needed to do. Not because we said it, but because they actually believed what the Word of God said. So Proverbs 22, 15 ought to be one of those verses that's just in your head and in your children's hearts all the time. You know, the folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. But that rod of discipline it cannot be delivered with anger. It's got to be delivered with pleasant words. And it's got to be delivered with the hope of the gospel. If it's payback and retribution, it doesn't count. That's making God ordinary. So the commands are to be on guard to protect your child. So it says, obey your father's commands. Don't neglect your mother's instructions. Then keep your wor their words always in your heart. Tie them around your neck. The Hebrew here is bind, so, so one of your translations probably say bind. And what it means is that it's memorizing the parents' words in such a way that they are permanently impressed on the child's basic, essential, mental, and spiritual being that controls and prompts his every action. And this, this fits very well with the NIV 84 translation of Deuteronomy 6, 7, impress these things on your hearts, on their hearts. God is to impress you, and you blown away by his things, and then those are the things that you give to your children. We're talking about heart-to-heart -heart transfer. We're not talking about data transfer. I'm, I'm, I'm answering your question, all this stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, they know they did the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, okay, this is not, oh, I thought it was okay to hit my brother. You know, just like, oh yeah, well, I, I was mad at my husband, but it was okay. <laughs> no. We know we're doing the wrong thing. And your children know they're doing the wrong thing. This is almost never information of, did you know that it was a wrong thing for you to trip your brother so he fall down the stairs? <laughs> yeah, he knew it, but he wanted to do it. So we're, this is not information transfer. It's heart to heart. You have, you've got to be blown away by God, and that's what you want to give to your children. So that's what exactly Deuteronomy 6, 7 is saying. Uh, these go 6, 6, 6. These commands I give you today are be on your hearts. Impress them on your children, verse 7. And then talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Notice the verse 22 which talks about the binding and impressing these things, verse 22 follows exactly the same order as Deuteronomy 6-7. When you walk, their counsel will lead you. When you sleep, they will protect you. When you wake up, they will advise you. 
This is where the hope is. If all they see is a parent who loses it at their stupidity, and they are stupid, okay? They are sinful, they are wicked, and they are evil at times. Let's not hide that. But how does God respond to you and me when we are, when we are like that? Grace. With grace. So, you know, we need to live in the world of Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. You endure hardship as discipline. No discipline is pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, it produces the harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. We need to live in that world. And help them to see that this discipline is a good thing for them. But this is, these are exactly what, what I read this in, when I read this in Walkie's commentary a couple of years ago, it just blew me away. This is this 622 is exactly what's in Deuteronomy 6 7, that same progression. And I like the new living here because it gives a little more, little more con context for us. When you walk, they will, their counsel will lead you. When you sleep, they will protect you. When you wake up, they will advise you. If your children are having night terrors, or they're screaming, or, or they're, they're, things are hard, or they're having dreams that are inappropriate, you can pray and ask God for help. And you can teach them to do that, to protect them. What translation them. is this? This is the New Living translation. My favorite translation is NIV 84. Unfortunately, it's not available. If you go to Bible Gateway, I, I, I pull up five translations. There, there, there's the ESV. The, the current NIV, which is a little bit too gender messed up for me, but still pretty good. And then there's the New Living, and then I have the um, um, New American Standard, which is almost literal word for word. And then I've recently gone to like the Christian Standard Bible, which is a pretty good mix of those things. But those five help. Is it safe to say, this verse 21, that regardless of the job that we do as a parent, if we do it biblically or if we do it non-biblically, either way, we're still impressing. Of course, yeah, we're impressing something. You know, Judges 2.10, there arose in Israel a nation which knew not the Lord, nor what he had done for Israel. And so there, and so remember, that that's how the saga starts in Judges 2.10. It ends in Judges 21 with, in those days Israel had no king, everybody did what was right in his own eyes. So if I don't teach them God's word, I will teach them to do what's right in their own eyes. And what, what is the mantra of this, of this century? Do what, do what you want to do. What you see is good. What you want is good. And if you don't do that, you're wrong. So if you become persuaded that, that you know, you're a female hiding, hiding inside a man's body, you're wrong. You've got to get out of that. You've got to say, no, I can't live that way. I've got to be true to what I am. As if we are the, the center point of reference. <clears throat> you want to talk about child abuse and child mutilation, the things that are being done to people surgically altered <sighs> that they can't get back. That's horrific. But we pull God out of the equation, that's what we're left with. So yeah, in the parenting, we are modeling creatures. We are designed for worship. We will worship something. Mm -hmm. If it's not God, we'll worship something. Ted Tripp uses an illustration. He says, <clears throat> this is a unique thing to, uh, to humans. He, say, he gives an example. He said, you know, if, if you look at one of the rivers in Alaska and the brown bears are out there, you know, diving and catching the salmon as they come back, there's no judges with brown bears on the side saying, oh, good, good, good job, big bear, you got a 10. You know, this is unique to us. We judge everything we do. And we, and we, and we try and get, we worship, we're worshiping something. The question is, what are you going to worship? It's not a matter of if you'll worship. All right, so there's that connection. So, that, so this command is a lamp. Instruction is a light, and this fits very much with Jesus' teaching about you know, if the light is bad, the body's messed up. Proverbs 4, 18 and 19 says you know, that, that the truth of God grows ever brighter to the full light of day, but the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They don't know what makes them, what, what makes them stumble. Mm. So when we start getting confused, it means I am not following what God wants me to do. Confusion is not a good sign. Confusion and doubt is not a good sign. 
It means I gotta get back to where God wants me to be. And then finally, it will keep you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue of the promiscuous woman. So what is, what is the it that is referred to in verse 24? Corrective discipline. Your words, your parental words. Not primarily church or any number of things, but the words you speak are the ones that will protect your children because you're the one that's with them the most. So then you can take whatever situation you want, Laura, and, and plug in, is this my framework? And this, see, this allows me to, in a sense, in the right sense, kind of get down in the mud with my kids. So, you sweetheart, I've been there. I know what this is like. You know, if you, men, if you've struggled with pornography and you've overcome it, don't hide that from your children. If you're struggling with anger, don't try and justify your anger as, as I've had a hard day. Because God hasn't called us to anger. He called us to love. The thing that he's called, you know, the, the, the basics there. I mean, just the first couple of sentences in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is not angry. It's not easily irritated. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love is patient. Love is kind. And if we could nail those four, we'd be doing a lot better than we are. Yeah. So, questions? Um, my question, or kind of a comment question, and myself as an example, you know, when Richie and I first started, um, coming to parenting workshops, we, you know, when you break the thing into the three categories of from zero to five, right, or, right. you know, establishing that, that right, um, right. authority, and then six to 12, <coughs> you're applying um, the, the principles, right. and then from 13 until then you're hopefully have laid that, those, that groundwork of authority and principle, and then you can just you know, that will manifest in the relationship, your relationship with your child and right. your relationship with God. You know, when we first started, our oldest at the time was eight. So we had already like not done the first two, like, no. not done the first two stages no. correctly. Um, so we, and you know, and even now having two teenagers, even though we have been being discipled by biblical parenting, um, for, for most of their childhood, I think looking back, we still did it a little rigidly, like with, with, with less, maybe not as much grace as we should have, thinking, well, if we just do these things, check, 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 yeah, check, check. Yeah. And, um, and although, you know, it, it's, it's so encouraging, even when our children don't behave the way they should all the time, that every now and then we see a glimpse of yep. the groundwork that's been laid, you know, and that's really, it's encouraging. Yep. But I'm, I guess I'm asking this for myself and maybe for some other parents. What do you do if you haven't laid that groundwork yep. and you're having well, to Well, this is what Laura asked Yeah, over. At, at, you know, 14 and 15, you're having to do both. You're having to lay authority, principle, and relationship all at Okay, so, so if I get to the point where I realize that I have been more like Moses in Numbers 20 than in Numbers 14, I, I come to that realization, right? And <clears throat> I confess to that, okay? I'm totally on board with that. You start with you were, anytime you recognize that you have not been where you need to be, you start with repentance. And so you go to your children and you say, guess what? You know, Dad blew it and maybe two hours later you can stop talking, okay? <laughs> You, you, you lay out what, what the particulars are that you are there. And then repentance, regret means, you know, re repentance is um, repentance is, is it's the Greek word metanoia. And basically it means Doing a 180, okay? 
and re regret, which would be right here. I stop right here, <clears throat> and I'm sorry for the mess I've created. But if I stay here, I haven't done anything positive. You know, gee, Dad, I'm glad, I'm glad you're sorry. You already messed everything up, okay? So repentance means that I have now started acting in such a way which is not this, but I'm with godly sorrow has produced something which leads to life. So if I was, whatever my particular issues were, whether it was laziness, whether it's anger, whether it's self-centeredness, whether it's demanding a higher standard of them than, than, than is right, whether it's a lack of grace, whatever, I start, I deal with God first. And then trust God to begin to work in me. Which is, which would, for anything, but particularly in this situation. And then when you begin to treat your children, you want to begin to incorporate some of these things where instead of demanding their behavior all the time, uh, be a certain way before you'll deal with them, become a refuge for them. So, and so you can become a resource. What we see, what we do as a parent, we see our kids messed up, right? And we desperately want to stop it, especially with teenagers. But they're not going to accept me as a resource if they don't see me first as a refuge. Is it appropriate in that repentance? I know that's important because it's you kind of laying out, this is what I've done wrong, right. and seeking forgiveness of that, right. um, and turning away from that. Right. But it is, is it appropriate? Because perception is huge. Sure. And even though, like, I, this is what I think I've done wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What my kid views could be something different. Is it appropriate at that point to give the child the opportunity to speak what they feel like the offenses have been? It's not only appropriate, it's mandatory. Okay. Which means that you got to buckle up and hang on. Even if their perception is different? You, you've you got to hear it before you can address it. Okay. You, know, you, want, you want to find out what's, because, look, I, personal experience. You know, my child says something and oh, I, you misunderstood. That's not what I meant. And so I immediately start defending myself. All, all I do there is just push them further down the road, okay? So I've got the, the, the verse that continues to just challenge me from James 3. Wisdom from above. It's, and I, I think I've, I think we have. I think you can find a workshop on this too. But yes, you should. But but. Mm -hmm. That's my verse, number eight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, three seventeen. Wisdom from above. So the wisdom from, that comes from heaven or from above is first of all pure, then peace loving, considerate and submissive. The considerate and submissive. The e, if you, anybody have an ESV? I do. I got one. What, what, what does your ESV say? In the middle. For James, what? 317. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason. Yes, okay. Open to reason, okay? Now, that one phrase, the ESV's translation says also J. Adams' translation is open to reason. So if you would ask me, am I open? Of course I'm open to reason. Just ask me. <laughs> it's not if I think I'm open to reason. Do my wife and my kids think I'm open to reason? Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, that now we're on dangerous ground. Mm -hmm. You know, when you do this, expose yourself to your teenagers or even to your spouse at that level of business struggles. I have to open myself up to this. And then, you know, it's... Um, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial and sincere. That's biblical wisdom. I've got a, po I've got a podcast on that. Is that. That's on the podcast site uh, where, where we talk about being open. It's a powerful thing, biblical wisdom. Wisdom from above. So I need to demonstrate that. That kind of transparency and openness to where I hear what it is they have to say. Even if it's inaccurate. Because if they're holding it inside, then they're con going to continue to deal with that. And, and so, Lord, suppose it is inaccurate. Is saying to them at that moment, well, you know what? You just got that one wrong. That doesn't fix anything. Uh, no. 
<laughs> so what, what you can do there is that's where the repentance is in there. You have to go live it out. And ask God to bless what you're saying. And bless, bless your actions so that they really see that you have changed. And lead by example on the repentance thing. Yeah, yeah or you die by example a little better. You know, and I, I serve by example. You know, I've got to just fall on God's face and say, Lord, use my failure and unbelief work in me in such a way so that there's no way I'm going to talk them back out of thinking I'm a great person or, or talk them to that. They already know I'm not. So let's stop trying to hide that. And just a bit, admit it that we have hope in Christ. So the, and if I have that brokenness in my teenager, you can't wave a magic wand. You can't give them the birthday present. You can't fix it with the ultimate thing that they want. You may do something like that, but that's not that's not the key. The key is you being humble before God, falling on your face before God, and asking God to do what you cannot, which is what the Christian life is about all the way, all the time anyway. So that and you can apply that to any particular situation you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been brokenness. God's in the business of healing brokenness. Sometimes when there's brokenness, does it seem like it's impossible? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. God's in the business of fixing the impossible. So did, did that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, I, I didn't forget your question, but we had to get this done to, to get no, there. No, no, that's good. No. Anybody else? There weren't any Facebook questions. Okay. All right. When you, if you have multiple children, yeah. I'm just curious about this because you know, sometimes my sin is like I don't just I don't have I don't display my sin in private with each child. Like sometimes my sin to one child is across the board for everybody yeah. to see. So when you have these conversations with your children, does there need to be? A, a family gathering? Does there need to be one on one, or maybe all of the above? Well, it depends upon the, the, if, if you've trashed the entire family, then go tell the entire family. Mm -hmm. But you can also do it one to one. You know, do both. But then the, the trick is we got to back it up. <coughs> you know, so we need to show that we really are, you know, doing the full 180, not just not just doing this. Anybody could do that. Well, and I, you know, I mean, because if we don't then, like you said before, you know, our children are built, are born with hypocrisy. Yeah, every yeah. child, every child comes with a built-in, highly functioning, well-designed yeah. hypocrisy checker. And we, I mean, you know, and we've experienced that with our, yeah. you know, with our teenagers where, they you know, we, we keep coming back and going, kind of confessing our own sinful response. Yeah but then responding that way again yeah. and again and again, and then we expect them to... to that, that, that's where you want to establish the dialogue, especially with teenagers. The little children, it's a little more tricky, but with teenagers, you want to have that back and forth where they're free to call you to account. Yeah. Hopefully you, not, you want to not make it nasty or disrespectful, but you want to open that channel, come to me. Because eventually if, if, if they keep having the same conversation with us, in terms of our response not changing, yeah. then they're going to quit coming to yeah. us. Because what's the point? You're That's not changing so either. Then you're not being a re refuge at that point. Mm -hmm. And again, the, the podcast I have, which, which is coming out this weekend probably, but on burnout and being tired, it's Matthew 11, 28 to 30, where we really are coming to God for Him to be our reference, our peace, our refreshment, that's what allows us to deal with our children in that way. So, do we have a better feeling here of what I'm talking about sin as a process and obedience as a process? Mm -hmm. Are we good with that? Does that make sense? Yeah, parent and child. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, we, but both are a process. And, and if, we, if I just look for the good act or I look for the bad act, I'm I might as well do what the world's doing. Yeah. Any questions or comments? You guys know how to get a hold of me. You know, super that you guys are all here today. And thank you for all the people out there in Facebook land.
And uh, again, you know, maybe get in touch with me, give me feedback on the podcast, and uh, really, really grateful for the opportunity to talk about this stuff today. Father, thank you for Christ. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us and care for us. And that your word really does have the truth that we need. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you understand, too, the one more thing here that what I'm doing here, this is not advanced child psychology. It's in the scriptures. Okay, so my job, I don't want you thinking that I've got these great truths here. I'm just trying to lay out what the Bible says. And so it, it's not about my style or my method. It's, is this accurate to what the scriptures say? If it's not, don't deal with it. But I, I don't want you to learn my methods or think that I've got some insight. I don't. The scriptures has that. So, anyway, thank you for thank you. thanks for running the machine.